Chapter 4. We left our travelers on the 5th of September, apprehending a present attack from the Sioux. Exaggerated accounts of this ferocity of this tribe and inspired the party with an earnest wish to avoid them. But the tale told by the friendly Ponca made it evident that a collision must take place. The night voyages were therefore abandoned as impolitic, and it was, res it was resolved to put on a bold face upon the matter and try what could be effected by blustering. The remainder of the night of the 5th was spent in more like demonstration. The large boat was cleared for action as well as possible, and the fiercest aspect assumed which the nature of the case would permit. Among other preparations for defense, the cannon was got out from below and placed forward upon the cuddy deck with a load of bullets by way of canister shot. Just before sunrise, the adventurers started up the river in high bravado, aided by a heavy wind, but the enemy might perceive no semblance of fear or mistrust. The whole party joined the Canadians in an up uproarious boat song at the top of the, of the Royces, making the woods reverberate in the buffalo stare. The Sioux, indeed, appeared of Mr. Robbins' bugbears par excellent. And he dwells upon them and their exploits with peculiar emphasis. The narrative embodies a detailed account of the tribe, an account which we can only follow when such portions as appear to possess novelty or an other important interest. Sioux is the French term for the Indians in question. The English have corrupted it into Sioux. Their primitive note name is said to be Darkotas. The original seats were on the Mississippi, but they had gradually extended their dominions and at the day of the journal occupied almost the whole of the vast territory circumscribed by the Mississippi, the Saskatchewan, the Missouri, and the Red River of Lake Winnipeg. They were subdivided in, into numerous clans, the Darkotas proper were the Winoa Cants, called the Jean Stulac by the French, consisting of, four, of about 500 warriors and living on both sides of the Mississippi in the vicinity of the falls of St. Anthony. Neighbors of the Winoa Cants and residing north of them on the river of St. Peter's were the Wapatomis, about 200 men. Still farther up to St. Peter's lived a band of 100 called the Wapituties. Among them, and by the French, the Jean des Pulis. Higher up the river yet, and at near its source, resided the Sisti Tunis, in number 200 or there, thereabouts. On the Missouri dwelt the Yanktons and the Tetons. Of the first tribe, there were two branches, the northern and the southern, of which the former led an Arab life in the plains of the sources of the Red, Sioux, and Jacques rivers, being in numbers about 500. The southern branch kept possession of this tract lying between the river Des Moines on the one hand and the rivers Jacques and Sioux on the other. But the Sioux were most renowned for deeds of violence of the Tetons, and of these there were four tribes. The Saonis, the Minicazonis, Minikanazis, the Okidanis, and the Boys Brulees. These last, a body of whom were now lying in wait to intercept the voyagers, were the most savage and formidable of the whole race. 
numbering about 200 men and residing on both sides of the Missouri near the rivers called the, by Captains Lewis and Clark, the White and the Tetting. Just below the Sh Cheyenne River were the Okidanis, 150, the Medicanazis, 250, occupied a tract between the Cheyenne and the Watarhu, and the Sayonis, the largest of the Tetan bands, counting as many as 300 warriors, were found in the vicinities of the Wirakone. Besides these four divisions, the regular Sioux, there were five tribes of seceders, called Asini Boins, the Metatope Asini Boins, 200 on Mouse River, between the Asini Boin and the Missouri, the Jean de Foule Asini Boins, the 250, occupying both sides of White River, the Big Devils, 450, wandering about the heads of Porcupine and Milk Rivers, with two other, other bands whose names are not mentioned, but who roved on the Saskatchewan and numbered together about 700 men. These seceders were often at war with the Parrot or original Sioux. In person, the Sioux generally are an ugly, ill-made race their limbs being much too small for the trunk, according to their our ideas of the human form. The cheekbones are high and their eyes are protruding from dull. The heads of the men are shaved, with the exception of a small spot on the crown, once a large tuft, long tuft is permitted to fall in plates upon the shoulders. This tuft is an object of scrupulous care, but is now and then cut off upon an occasion of grief or solemnity. A full-dressed Sioux chief presents a striking appearance. The whole surface of the body is painted with grease and coal. A shirt of skins is worn as far down as the waist, while around the middle is a girdle of the same material, and sometimes a cloth, about an inch in width. This supports a piece of blanket, blanket of, or of fur passing between the thighs. Over the shoulders is a white dressed buffalo mantle, the hair of which is worn next to the skin in fair weather but turned outwards and wet. This robe is large enough to envelop the whole body and is frequently ornamented with porcupine quills, which make a rattling noise as the warrior moves. As well as with a great variety of rudely painted figures emblemental of the warrior's military character. Fastened to the top of the head is worn a hawk's feather adorned with porcupine quills. Leggings of dressed antelope skin serve the purpose of pantaloons and have seams at the sides about two inches wide and bespotted here and there with small tufts of hair, human hair, and trophies of sc some scalping excursion. The moccasins are of elk or buffalo skin, and the hair worn inwards, or on great occasions, the chief is seen with the skin of a polecat dangling at the heel of each boot. The Sioux are indeed partial to this noisome animal, whose fur is in high favor of, for tobacco pouches and other appendages. The dress of, of Chief Tain's squall is also remarkable. Her hair is suffered to grow long and parted across the forehead and hangs loosely behind or is collected into a kind of net. Her moccasins do not differ from her husband's, but her leggings extended upwards only as far as the knee, where they met by an awkward shirt of elk skin, depending to the ankles and supported by a string going over the shoulders. This shirt is usually confined to the waist by a girl and overall, is thrown a buffalo mantle like that of the men. The tents of the Teton or Teton Sioux so, 
are described as a neat construction, being formed of white dressed buffalo hide, while it's secured by and supported by poles. The region infested by the tribes in question extends along the banks of the Missouri for some 150 miles or more, and is chiefly prairie land, and but is occasionally dis diverse by hills. These latter are always deeply cut by gorges or ravines, which in the middle of the summer are dry but forms the channels of muddy and impetuous torrents during the season of rain. Their edges are fringed by with thick woods, as well as as top as a bottom. But the prevalent aspects of the country is that of a bleak lowland with rank herbage and without trees. The soil is strongly impregnated with, with mineral substances in great variety, among others with globber salts, copperas, sulfur, and alum, which tinge the water on the river and impart it to a no nauseous odor and taste. The wild animals most usual are the buffalo, deer, elk, and antelope. We again resume the words of the journal. September 6th. The country was open and the day remarkably pleasant. So that we were all in pretty good spirits, not with standing the expectation of attack. So far we had not caught even a glimpse of an Indian and we were making rapid way through the, their dreaded territory. It was too well aware, however, of the savage tactics to suppose that we were not narrowly watched and had made up our mind that we should hear something of the Tetons. At first gorge, which would afford them a convenient lurking place, about noon a Canadian bawled out, the Sioux, the Sioux and directed attention to a large, narrow ravine, which intersected the prairie on our left, extending from about the, the banks of the Missouri as far as the eye could reach, to a southwardly course. The scully was the bed of a creek, but its waters were now low, and the sides rose up like the huge regular walls on each side. By the aid of a spyglass, I perceived at once the cause of the alarm given by the voyager. A large party of mountain savages were coming down the gorge in Indian file with the evident intention of taking us unawares. Their calumet feathers had been the means of their detection, for every now and then we could see some of these bobbing up and down above the edge of the gully, as was the bed of the ravine forced to, to the wearer to rise higher than usual. We could tell that they were on horseback by the motion of their, these feathers. The party were, was coming upon us with great rapidity, and I gave the word to pull them with all haste so as to pass the mouth of the creek before they reached it. As soon as the Indians perceived it, by our increased speed that we were discovered, they were discovered, they immediately raised a yell, scrambled out, on the, out of the gorge, and galloped down upon us to the numbers of which about a hundred. Our situation was now somewhat alarming. At almost any other part of the Missouri which we passed during the day, I should not have cared so much for these freebooters, but just here, the banks were remarkably steep and high. Partaking of the character of the creek banks and the savages were enabled to look overlook us completely, while the canyon upon which we had placed so much reliance could not be brought to bear upon them all. What added to our difficulty was that the current in the middle of the river was so turbulent and strong that we could make no headway against it except by dropping arms and employing our whole force at the oars. The water near the northern shore was too shallow even for the baroque, and our only mode of proceeding, if we decided to proceed at all, was by pushing it within a moderate stone's throw over the left or, or south of southern bank, where we were completely at the mercy of the Sioux, but where we could make good headway by means of our poles and wind, aided by the eddy 